a guy over here going and I'm George like, Janko sat down once again for a conversation with Cliff from Ask Cliff. In this conversation, they hit on the topic of speaking on tongues. And George actually shares some of his experience and what he thinks about speaking in tongues and whether that is something that we should be necessarily practicing or I would even argue maybe pursuing. So we go ahead and share my screen and let's uh let's hear him out. He's never offended. He's so thirsty to see, like, is he carrying something that I should learn? But we've been going back on two things. One is uh, the speaking in tongue. I want to like, I, I want to learn from you guys, right? Because in the gospel it talks about speaking in tongue uh, so many times. And, uh, but there's so many different versions of tongue that people see it as. First thing I want to point out is the gospel itself, we don't really see a, particular mention of speaking in tongue. Uh, we don't see this. Uh, this is something that we see Jesus doing in the gospel. This is something that we see the uh, the, the disciples doing in, in the gospel. We do see this happening later in, in the scripture, uh, particularly with Paul and Corinthians, which I'll hit on here in a second. Um, but I do admire and appreciate George, uh, his his desire, right, uh, to learn, his desire to, to dig deep into the word of God, his desire to have these conversations. It's a desire to have on uh, these these guests, right? That he's learning from. It's it's so encouraging and and motivating to see how this relationship that he's been kind of developing with with Cliff and hearing him talk about, hey, I have your number, I can call you uh, whenever I, I want, right? But that's great. And you see how even from a distant, uh, Cliff has been playing a, a large role in, in George's uh, growth, his spiritual growth, his maturity. And you can say that Cliff is. Uh, taking on a, a big a big part in his discipleship and his and just kind of helping him uh, understand different things, encouraging him. And it really is just encouraging, especially when we see and we hear these stories about this not, not necessarily happening in, in different places. Uh, and obviously, you know, during this podcast, very popular in a, on a public platform. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful for for people to see this. And I think it's wonderful for christians particularly to see this and and be uh be encouraged you know be be uh, be motivated right uh the scripture talks about kind of being uh spurring one uh, one another uh on and i think this is a good example of that let's go ahead and continue the video here i, I want to know what do you guys think tongue in the gospel is acts chapter 2 the day of pentecost there were a lot of people who spoke different languages and all of a sudden, the Apostle Peter stood up and communicated the gospel. And the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the gift of tongues, meaning by that they were able to speak in languages that they had never spoken before in, they had never learned. And the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak those languages to communicate the gospel. Amen. The second use of tongues is in 1 Corinthians, uh, speaking in... So I'm going to stop here just for, for a quick second. It is important to to keep in mind, and Cliff is going to uh, hit on this as we continue the video. Um, the speaking in tongue in Acts chapter two is uh, different from the speaking in tongue that we see in, in uh, the First Corinthians, um, and I think that's something that we should keep in mind. Right, the distinction is is meaningful. Why is it different? It's something that we need to kind of think through and, and wrestle with. Um, then there's going to be you know people going to land on different sides of that particular argument. But I, one thing I want to point out is in Acts two when you see this happening with the uh, Peter and the, and the uh, other disciples preaching the gospel in languages they didn't know. A lot of uh, biblical scholars see this as a a reversal um, or a correction of what we saw happen in Genesis 10 when the the nations were. Um, I believe it's Genesis 10. But Genesis 10 is a table of nations, and I believe Genesis 11 is when they're when they're dispersed. But this is kind of a a correction of of that event. You, God is bringing the nations back together. He's, in a sense, drawn them back to himself. Obviously, we know this This happened through Jesus Christ, but when we see this in Acts 2, it's more of a, it's more of a clearer picture in that sense. In tongues is in a language that nobody knows. It's a unknown language, but there must be an interpreter there. So the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, they speak in an unknown language that nobody knows. I think this is very important. Um, this is something that a lot of times people don't don't want to practice um, in charismatic churches. But the truth is, is that Paul does say this, right? 
If someone is speaking in tongues, there must be an interpreter there. Otherwise, you're not edifying. You're not building up the church. Nobody can understand what was being said. So when, when this scenario happens, there's a process, a principle that we as Christians are to follow. If you're speaking in, in a tongue and there's no interpreter, you should either do so in private. And I've heard some people say that maybe they'll do it in a more quieter voice, or maybe they just kind of do it um, without speaking out loud. But it's something that we do need to keep in mind and put into practice. Speaker of the tongue and the interpreter to communicate the message. And if there's a breakdown there, Paul says, watch out. That's not from the Holy Spirit. But my only concern is this, like, I, I oh, sorry. I didn't mean to flick that spider towards you. It just came at me <laughs> and I had Jeez. no idea what to do. Sorry, George. I'm so sorry. We I didn't know what to do. Here. I yeah. just, uh, I thought you could handle it. Um, <laughs> Thanks for that compliment. So sorry. Uh, okay. So I asked him, I go, why do you need to speak in tongue? Right? Cause when I saw the scripture, I read that and it made sense. Fire came from heaven mm -hmm. into their mouths for them to speak in different languages. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Right? Because if Jesus yep. came down and he's like, Hey, I need you to go talk to my people. His people are all over the world. So my mind is tongues, different tongues. Let me give an example. When I think of this, I think of when people can't speak my language, my dialect, because their tongue. Christ, right? But you say that there is a, a version where they're speaking in like gibberish and that other man translates it. Interprets. So if his word is forever and always, right? Mm -hmm. It's Jesus is the same. Is their tongue going on now? Have you guys witnessed this with your own eyes? Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever spoken in tongue? I've never spoken in tongues, but we see people at our church mm -hmm. speak in tongues over somebody, especially if they're. And I think this is a an important thing to point out and emphasize. The gifts did not cease. The gifts continue, right? There is no particular passage of scripture that you can point to say, hey, the, the gifts stopped. It's not there. Um, and obviously you get into a bit of a back and forth between continuationists and a cessationist. And if it wasn't clear, I am a continuationist. I do think the gifts continue. I think the gifts are well. And, but we do know that Unfortunately, in some cases, these gifts are being abused, and we're not in favor of that. Uh, but I think to try to dismiss them outright is not the best way to look at it. It is not the best approach. And I would argue it doesn't honor the scriptures. It doesn't honor the God we are professing to believe in, the God that we are professing to worship. Go ahead and continue the video here. They're suffering, and it's one of the more powerful things I've ever seen. Really? Because there's some type of access they have to the Holy Spirit right out of Acts chapter two, that you see that you think, wow, if they were directly just speaking in English or Spanish, whatever it might be, there's there's something less powerful there. So I don't wanna make it a gimmick. I don't wanna make it a type of, oh, you know, this is how we work towards God because it's all about me and my ability with tongues. I don't wanna make it that way, but I have certainly seen the tears flow. I've certainly seen this level of depth that that you don't typically get with, with your own tongue. Well, I don't get prayer. it. So I, no, okay. I'm going to put myself as an example, not to talk about myself, but just because I only watched myself grow yeah. up. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had a relationship with God in a very, very young age. I would go at like, like third or second grade. There was a church right next to my house and I would sit in the field and just talk to God as a child. But I never spoke in tongue. I never had the ability to speak in tongue. I meet gentlemen like you guys that have faithfully worked for Christ, never spoke in tongue. Mm -hmm. So why is it that I should even believe that another man is speaking in tongue? Like how do I and, and how do I translate that? And how do I not get angry at that? That just it, it irritates me because like, how can I look to my neighbor and try to convince him that Christ exists? And I and no disrespect when i say this to anybody who believes in tongue but like i'm like yeah christ exists he could be there for you read the gospel speak back to you and then i have a guy over here going blah, 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 and i'm like bro like how do i and i don't and, and no disrespect right. no disrespect i mean this sincerely like this guy looks like he's going off the rails like he's not mentally there and then i'm trying to explain to this person that you should take my bible seriously how, how do i how do i even bridge this if myself i don't believe in this you know what i mean mm -hmm. how do i and I think it's a fair point, right? His, his, his idea, his example is more or less, hey, I'm trying to tell somebody um, about Jesus. And I'm trying to you know, point him to the evidence that shows that there truly is a God, uh, that shows that Jesus is who he claims to be, who he, who he says he is, right? 
And then you have people out here doing things like speaking in tongues. Um, and for the unbeliever, that's kind of like, whoa, like, like what is going on? Like this, this, this is, this makes no sense. Uh, so I definitely understand where he's coming from in that. But I think ultimately we have to remember that to the un unbelieving world, we're always going to look a little crazy. We, we believe in a, in a God um, that was crucified and then rose from the dead, right? Uh, remember in the, in the gospel and even in the, as you will look, the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts, since Chris mentions uh, the book of Acts, this whole idea of a dying and, you know, the way he died, right? That was like on on unheard of, uh, especially for the Jews when it came to the Messiah. It wasn't something that they were expecting. It wasn't something that they wanted to um, believe in. Um, and I think in, in, in Corinthians, Paul mentions how to the unbelieving world, the gospel is it's offensive. All that to say, yeah, there's a sense in which it's always kind of be going to be viewed that way, but it shouldn't stop us, right? Um, and again, if there's a person, if you're, to, if you're going to a church and there's someone out there consistently speaking in tongues, and the leadership is not doing anything to address this, that's a different conversation. Um, but I just negate whether something is true or not, is my point. Hey, how do we be a good Christian boy? Just keep focusing on Christ. Keep challenging people to read the Gospels for themselves. You and I as thinking human beings owe it to ourselves to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the historical eyewitness accounts of how Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead, and then ask, is Jesus trustworthy? Does the evidence point to his reliability, his credibility, or does it not? And the other stuff, you're, you're, you're going to have to just keep going. <laughs> How come Jesus never spoke about tongue? Good question. Good Jesus question. didn't spoke about didn't speak about a lot of things. Remember, the Gospels are selective accounts of what Jesus spoke about. Yes. And John writes at the end of his Gospel, if I was to record everything that Jesus said and did, there wouldn't be enough pages to fill it. Okay. So... I like how Cliff says this, right? And this is what I was saying earlier. We as believers, we're, we're always growing in our faith. And I love how Cliff is taking the time out to explain this to him and kind of break it down for him in a way that makes sense for George. Um, and I, I think it's very helpful. I think this is something that we should all uh, strive to do. Um, and do so, you know, in, in a same kind of uh, demeanor that Cliff is showcasing here. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians uh, 14. So we're going to look at a couple of verses here. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, this is the NIV. Paul says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. I think this is something that needs to be emphasized. The Apostle Paul, right, tells us to eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so for those who want to dismiss the gifts, this is something that they have to Face, right? It's something to have to wrestle with. Why are you disregarding this particular passage? It seems to be pretty direct, and I would argue seems like a command. He continues, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to, to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. This is important, right? What Paul is pointing out here that, well, yes, desire all the spiritual gifts. And yes, speaking in tongues uh, is a good thing. It edifies you, right? Uh, prophesying is better in the sense that everyone can understand and edifies the church, right? Not, not just an individual. That's important. But let's continue. What else does Paul say? I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. And here's what, what I was saying. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Speaking in tongues is a good thing, right? And Paul desires for everyone to speak in tongues. But... The same, the same spirit, the one spirit that gives all the gifts does not give everyone all the same gifts. So we shouldn't use this as a, and, and the video will continue, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use this as a way to say, hey, someone is 
more uh is is better than someone else because they speak in tongues is they're uh, more holy they're closer to god because they speak in tongues they can do more things because they speak in tongues that's not that's not what paul is saying that's not the, the point of the scripture we're all given um specific gifts to help build up the church right to grow the church to uh to reach people um and that's the approach that we should take gifts are a good thing but we should keep in mind that these gifts come from god for a particular purpose we shouldn't use the gifts as a, as a way to divide and as a way to elevate ourselves. Let's make sure that as we use our gifts, we are most importantly honoring God, you know, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time.